Kansas City veterans report for training camp on July 25th at Missouri Western State University in St. Joseph, Missouri, as they look to continue one of their best five-year runs in program history. We'll find out if the Chiefs have what it takes to keep rolling along with an exodus of key coaches and players as we preview training camp for Kansas City by going one-on-one -on -one with Matt Connor, editor for Arrowhead Attic, that fan-sided, on the OFN Meeting Room with Greg DePama. It's Tuesday, July 3rd, 2018. I'm Greg DePama. Thanks for tuning into the OFN meeting room as we preview NFL training camps for the 2018 season. And we continue today with Kansas City Chiefs editor for Arrowhead Attic, that fan sided Matt Connor. Matt, thanks for helping us talk Kansas City Chiefs football today. Of course, of course. Happy to do it. Thanks so much for having me on. All right. Good to have you here, Matt. So uh, tell me about your work at Fansided. How, how long have you been with them? Uh, I've been with them for about 18 months. Before that, I was with um, SB Nation as an NFL editor and assignment editor for several years and uh, sort of covering not only the Chiefs but also kind of the whole league. So, Are you, been, you a Chief fan? You've been a Chief fan for a while? Yeah, I grew up a Chiefs fan ever since I first saw, um, I don't know if you remember the Nigerian Nightmare. Chris sure. Koye. Yes. But, um, yeah, I saw, I saw him, and I was spitting at the age of 10 and just thought he was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my <laughs> life and kind of pledged allegiance ever since. All right, that's cool. Uh, and as I said at the Open, uh, you know, if you take a look back, it's been about 20 years or so since the Chiefs, you know, it was Marty Schottenheimer days, uh, when they were, you know, they, they were going through a nice run and they were in the playoffs. They just couldn't get over the hump. Uh, and now you, you take a look at it. Just five years ago, uh, the, the team hires uh, Dorsey and Reed. Uh, they make the deal for Alex Smith. And they go on uh, an incredible five-year run uh, for the organization, including the first back-to-back -back, uh, AFC West titles they've ever had, which is surprising for such a good organization. It's been around for a long time with a lot of success. Uh, but unfortunately, it's just like that team from 20 years ago, just one playoff win to show for it. That's got to be frustrating. <laughs> uh, it's been very frustrating. It's, um, it's interesting how quickly the fan base becomes – um, really frustrated with only making the playoffs <laughs> yeah. year after year, uh, despite the fact that there was that huge gap that you mentioned. Um, so even this year, there was talk of like Andy Reid potentially being on some sort of hot seat. I mean, of course, that was just only among fans. It's, yeah. it's almost a laughable idea. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, but yeah, it, it's it's definitely uh, people are hungry for for some actual postseason. Um, success. All right. So, how's uh, Brett Veach been doing? Uh, you uh, had a, an article come out just a couple of days ago, actually, to talk about uh, you know his past year taking over for Dorsey. So that's a big job. He had his first draft. Um, you know, I look at the players in the draft, and I'm like, okay. I mean, uh, you know, you don't have the first round pick, so that is definitely yeah. an issue. But that's that's a good thing because uh, you've got yourself a quarterback. And that's uh, that, that, that. As long as he's the guy, that is huge, as we know. Uh, so he kind of counts uh, with what we see here. But uh, still, there, there, you know, the draft. You wonder what you get there. There are some guys that uh, might have been overdrafted, but uh, Veach has a plan. Uh, and there's a lot of turnover as well with trades uh, and uh, free agent moves. So uh, a lot of changes we're going to go into with this roster. How do you think he's done? Um, yeah, I think he's done an admirable job. I, I, he's been much more aggressive than anyone thought he might be, and and that started immediately. I don't know if you remember last summer. Um, typically, teams are pretty cemented heading into training camp, and then they make changes. And he pretty immediately got on the phone and said, "Let me give you a draft pick for Reggie Ragland from the Buffalo Bills." And then he went to the Cleveland Browns and said, "Let me give you a draft pick for Cam Irving." And, so he's out there trying to buy low on some formerly highly regarded draft assets, um, and he's kind of continued that throughout the whole year, whether Dang. it was bringing in Darrell Rivas at the end of the year or, or even this whole offseason. 
All right. Well, let's uh, go into the roster that he's assembled. Uh, of course, it's not all his, but uh, there's a lot of changes. So uh, let's uh, start first of all. I tell you what. Before we get into the offense, uh, Eric Bieniemy takes over as the offensive coordinator. But this is, of course, still Randy Reed's uh, offense. So, so what is Bieniemy yep. going to do though? differently as far as responsibility uh, that we saw uh, over the last uh, few years with, uh, with, with uh, Nagy? You know, that's going to be a really interesting dynamic because the Chiefs already had the league's leading rusher before bringing Enemy into the picture. You know, Enemy was behind the running game um, when, when, uh, when Matt Nagy was, uh, was your offensive coordinator there. So, um, you know, it's not it's not like they can really run the ball that much more when they're already running it. You know, at a at a clip where their where their guy can lead the league. Um, but I do think you're going to see a little bit more balance and maybe even maybe even emphasize the run a lot more with a rookie under center. Hmm. Okay. Um, at the very least, for the first few games, I would think you're leaning upon him. And you know, Spencer Ware um, was lost all last season due to injury, but he was the bell cow back the previous season and through the first six weeks of the year he was right there among the league leaders in terms of yards from scrimmage sort of receiving and rushing so uh you know he's i think there's a lot of potential there if he can come back from his current injury he's still nursing that same injury he had from last august so that kind of remains to be seen but it could potentially be a a, a dynamic sort of one-two punch um you know, maybe along the lines of like what the Falcons have in, in Tevin Coleman and and, um, and Devontae Freeman. Sure, and that could come in handy uh, come playoff time again, right? I'm sure the fans weren't yeah. very happy with the lack of uh, running attempts uh, in the playoffs <laughs> last year. Uh, what about uh, the, the the what's what's start off? I tell you what, let's start off with the running backs because there are three new running backs. You got West, you got Wares as as the primary. Especially you you you've got Hunt, of course, who, who's who's going to be uh, you know the the bell cow if you want him to be. But uh, you, you have Damian Williams and Kerwin Williams, and and they've had their share of touches uh, uh, you know recent years. But uh, the guy that intrigues me is Darrell Williams. The uh, rookie yeah. free agent. I mean, here's a guy that has played in the shadows of, uh, you know, Leonard Fournette, uh, Darius Geis. Uh, and yet when he had his moments at LSU, he seemed to do well. And we've seen this before. We've seen players like this at major, whether it's a quarterback or a running back, uh, they just get behind these really good players. They don't have, and, and they're really good prospects. And then they get their chance in the NFL. And all of a sudden, look, you, you, you got a nice sleeper. Yeah, word out of camp has been really special about him. I, uh, you know, I, it's going to be hard to break that active roster. I mean, they they have brought in more competition here at a position that really wasn't a huge need anyway. Yeah. Like you said, they brought in three different guys named Williams, which is even hard to tell them apart. But um, you know, it. Uh, you know, I think the Damian Williams they brought him in from the Miami Dolphins. He's going to compete for that scat back sort of role with Shark Kendrick West. So that's good. That'll probably be like just the best of those two. Okay. I think the Spencer Ware injury, personally, will be um, what really makes or breaks it for a lot of these guys. You know, if 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 Ware has to start the season on the physically unable to perform list, that may open up a spot for like a Darrell Williams. But you know, I'm my assumption is that that it will be a little bit too hard to make the active roster in that role. But but I'd love to see him slip through the practice squad because I agree with you. I I think there's pretty good potential there for for at least something to to flesh itself out if the coaches can can hold his talent and of course sherman uh one of the top fullbacks in the league so uh he's back uh quarterback situation so what's your gut tell you of all the quarterbacks you've seen and uh, not only at the chiefs but in the league and from what you have seen the glimpses of patrick mahomes uh what do you think what do you what are your expectations you personally <laughs> you know um i it's hard not to have um, sky high expectations for this kid. Um, I, I mean, the whole organization is is very high on him. The guys whose very jobs are on the line have declared he's it. He's ready. Um, you know the comparisons to a Favre kind of player are you know are floating out there. Tom Bahali came out you know today and even in another earlier interview this week you know saying oh this guy reminds me of Favre and uh, you know so. It creates pretty high expectations. 
However, I you know the the Chiefs have walked an incredible tightrope through this whole process. I mean, it could have been, you know, when you think of today's NFL, it's twenty four seven coverage. Drama is created out of the smallest things, and everyone handled it perfectly. Alex Smith was a perfect professional. Yep, mentored him. Mahomes played the role of like willing rookie. Just I'm here to learn and, and nothing else. And no one ever said the wrong thing or did the wrong thing. And so now they're handing it over after he's learned for a full year. They've surrounded him with, I mean, I would put the weapons that Kansas City has assimilated around their quarterback up against any other group of weapons in the NFL, and that would include the Steelers or anyone else for that matter. Um, So if a rookie is going to have a chance for instant success and to live up to the sort of lofty expectations that everyone has placed on him. Um, I, th- I think he's in that spot with a coach who yep. has handled a lot of drama in the past, uh, you know, whether Terrell Owens or Michael Vick or whatever. He's, he's been through it. He's seen it all. And, and I think he's got a really special kid to work with. Yeah, when he was coming out, uh, even you know, you, there, there was still kind of at, at the time there was still that wonder about spread, Big Twelve quarterbacks. Can they make the transition? And this is the year before Baker Mayfield, so could they make yeah. the tra- maybe that made it a lot easier for for uh, for teams to uh, to accept Mayfield. Uh, but it, it, being a Jet fan, when when he was coming out, I, I actually was like, you know what? If, if when I was thinking about, I mean, I was a big Watson fan. Uh, but Mahomes intrigued me. I said, you know what? Uh, I think I'd be willing to take a shot with Mahomes. There's something about him uh, that when you take away that spread nonsense, there's just something about the way he handles himself, about his athletic ability uh, that intrigues me. And then I think I'd be willing to take a chance with him. And then all of a sudden, when he went to Kansas City, and you know he's going to be coached by Andy Reid and the system that he runs, it was like, that's that's perfect. I mean, that is a great because that because that's uh, you know you, we know all uh, so much about these young quarterbacks that come out. It really matters where they go, whether it's yeah. personnel or coaching. He couldn't have went to a better location and a better coach. Yeah, I I totally agree. I uh, I spoke with Cliff Kingsbury, Patrick Mahomes college coach, right after the draft last year, and and that's what Kingsbury kept coming back to you saying. You know, look, not only is Mahomes an incredible talent, I mean, his dad was a professional athlete. This kid knows what it takes. And Mahomes, too, let's not forget, I mean, he was a basketball star, a baseball star, yeah. and a football star. I mean, uh-huh. he excelled in every single thing he's ever touched. And so, you know, you have this incredible, well-rounded athlete who's grown up in, like, un- in the professional spotlight, knows what it takes to conduct yourself accordingly, and then, and then Kingsbury said, "You put this special kind of kid with the one coach who's going to maximize yep. all that in Andy Reid." He, you know, he said, "Of course, we're thrilled that Mahomes would go anywhere in the draft. You know, you root for your players, but but when when it was Reid who got a hold of him, traded up, you know, Kingsbury just said, you know, like that was it, yep. like that was the magic spot." And, and and you mentioned the talent that's that that he's surrounded by. I was going to mention that because I, I was thinking about Alex Smith going. Hey, as soon as I leave, you go out and you sign Sammy Watkins. I mean, he's had so – I mean, the Chiefs have not, as you know, had good depth of receiver. It's been like one wide yeah. receiver has been out there for the past, like, five years. He's always just had one receiver and a really good tight end, of course, but no depth at the wide receiver position at all that he's had to work with. And then as soon as he leaves, oh, Sammy Watkins is in. Uh, but anyway, that's a really good deal for Mahomes, to be able to have Sammy Watkins, Tyreek Hill – now doesn't oh, I mean one of these guys is going to be left alone, which is going to be great. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll see what Chesson does if he could develop. Uh, you also have a couple of very intriguing rookie free agents in Pringle and Mac. You know maybe they make the practice squad. Keep an eye on those guys. Uh, Anthony Thomas has never really developed, but uh, bottom line is, uh, like you said, you you throw in Kelsey, and this is a heck of a receiving uh, uh, group that Kansas City just hasn't had in a long time. Yeah, I, it's really clear to me, looking um, at the full body of work that Brett Beach has done as the general manager, that he looked at that Titans playoff loss last year and just said, I'm fixing all of this nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, when Travis Kelsey went out... It was over. Kelsey went down in that game <laughs> with a concussion. Yeah. Uh, and suddenly the Chiefs went from, you know, they're up by, they're up by several touchdowns and in full control of a playoff game... 
and then suddenly the offense just went one-dimensional. Defenses could key in. Um, it, it was just embarrassing, really. Yeah. And so, you know, people said, like, any. I mean, even now, you know, I read something today about Stephon Diggs and, and some others who are going to um, profit from the insane amount of money that the Chiefs gave Sammy Watkins, basically, is what everyone's saying. How they overpaid, all this stuff. But Sammy Watkins is there to let Travis Kelsey be Travis Kelsey, to let Tyree Hill be Tyree Hill. That's Hill. right, and, yeah. And so that, that playoff loss and then the subsequent addition of Watkins isn't just about adding whatever stats Watkins puts on the on paper at the end of the year. It's really about how much he frees everyone up to do the maximum damage they can do. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think it was a I think it was a, a deal worth doing, even if it was as expensive as it was. Now, do you think? See, see when I, I mean, like when I first look and I and I, and I remember the Kelsey's injury last year, and I look at the depth of tight end, I go, yeah, but what happens if Kelsey gets hurt again? But then the first thing that I, that pops in my head is the fact, well, but now they got the depth of wide receiver that there wouldn't be such an issue. Uh, Still, you would think maybe next off season, the Chiefs, because Kelsey is such a big part of their offense, maybe they go out and and, and draft a, a young tight end as a good backup, because they really don't have anybody that that's dangerous or up and coming uh, behind Kelsey, right? No, no. I mean, you have a guy there named Demetrius Harris. He's been there for three years, sort of entrenched, and every year he's among the worst in 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 drop percentage. I mean, <laughs> And, and every Chiefs fan has their like least favorite Demetrius Harris drop. Uh oh. Um, he's a former College of Basketball player. He's a huge target. He should be a perfect end zone threat. I personally thought he may be gone after John Dorsey left because John Dorsey loved. Let me take this big College Basketball forward and turn him into a tight end. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but yeah, he's he's stuck around with Beach. So so maybe the potential is still there. But but honestly, it's been a three or four season experiment that hasn't yet really work as planned. And what about Chesson? Uh, Chesson has the most talent when you get past the top three. So is there still some hope after, you know, pretty much just a you know typical rookie year for a mid-round pick, uh, nondescript and such, uh, chances that he could step up this season and be a bigger contributor, maybe be the number four? Well, yeah, yeah, I'd love to see it. You know, you, you mentioned Tyreek, you mentioned Sammy. You know, there's Chris Conley coming yep. back from injured reserve. Um, a lot of people like Demarcus Robinson. You know, he was taken in the round before Tyreek Hill. Um, you know, in in, uh, in the 2015 draft, 2016 draft. Um, what I'd love to, you know, they traded up to get Mahomes. They trade Dorsey did. Dorsey then traded up in the third to get Kareem Hunt. And two for two. That looks pretty good. And then he did another trade up in the fourth to get Chasson. So I, I think there's some. I think there's some talent there. Uh, but he's been buried on the depth chart and relegated to, to very limited special teams duty. Uh, someone has to step up there. Yeah. Um, so my, my assumption is I, I probably put my money on Demarcus Robinson. Okay. Um, because of some things he's flashed. But but certainly, you know, they traded up to get him for a reason. Um, you know, despite the down year he had at Michigan. Um, you know, right before the draft. So, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, Robinson, actually, I think he was, like, second uh, on the team last year uh, as far as uh, uh, completion percentage uh, with uh, – if you, if, if you take out Tyree Kill out of the equation, you know, he, he did a better job of connecting. Uh, still not great. I think he was still under 60%, but fact is uh, he did he did show himself uh, to be uh, effective uh, in his role So uh, and also a young receiver. So – uh, again, good unit. We'll see how they develop. Uh, as far as the offensive line is concerned, uh, it looks like there's a big question at left guard. Uh, now, Morris is coming back from the injury. Uh, you've got two good tackles. So talk about, is that, the, is that the case? Is that like the one spot on the offensive line that's going to be uh, the, the, the source spot that needs to be taken care of? Or do you think it's, it's in better shape than, than I think? I I would say I would you know honestly I'd put it a little bit more questionable than even what you put it I I think left guard is a carousel that no one really seems to want to claim the starter spot um, they just brought in an undrafted free agent named Alex Hunter um, who played left tackle at Bowling Green but was actually rated like the top Canadian prospect 
um, you know, coming out this year, like they were going to take him in the CFL, and the Chiefs convinced him to not play in Canada, but like let's tr- like try out for us in the NFL. Okay. So he's so he's got some flavor there, and they were actually putting him in for first team reps at guard. And when I saw that, it, you could either read that as like, "Wow, did they find this incredible <laughs> undrafted gym?" Yeah. Or are things that pathetic that we're already <laughs> putting in? You know, a guy who slipped through seven rounds in, into the spot. So yeah. I don't know whether to, I don't know how to read that. Uh-huh. Um, but Andy Reid himself said, "Well, we're not going to flesh anything out until training camp, and then we'll figure it out there." So I, I, you know, maybe they'll swing a deal. I mean, I, I mean, it could be that someone else completely That's ends true. up occupying that spot. Yeah. And by the way, is McKenzie is, is is he making the transition to the offensive line, the rookie? Yeah, and that's going to be a long play. I mean, I, you know, I think he's going to be part of the inactive rosters, so they keep. I think if they put him on the practice squad, someone will pick him up. Um, and so I think they're going to. I think he'll make the active roster, but okay. I, but I think he's, he'll be inactive the whole year. That's that's my guess. All right, I just think it's going to be too long. But they were really high on him coming out of the draft, saying, "Hey, we didn't just draft him because he's Reggie McKenzie's son." Or, yeah. <laughs> you know, they traded two seventh round picks to move up in the sixth and, and and get him. So they're serious about trying that out. Okay, now let's uh, move over to defense and uh, up front first. Uh, defensive line, you've got uh, Chris Jones who. Uh, has uh, really taken off uh, three one of the top three four defensive ends in football the way he played last season so he's got a great future. Uh, also have Alan Bailey there, uh, he's a decent player and he also and uh, also Jarvis Jenkins. So uh, depth though seems to be a problem to me when I look at this. Uh, the entire line actually, I mean Xavier Williams comes in. Uh, you drafted uh, Derek um, uh, Nadi. Uh, but you lost Benny Logan. Uh, Nunez Roches is gone. So, uh, yeah, depth seems to be a problem because uh, I think that they're, they're, they're pretty happy, though, with Xavier Williams, good run defender. That's what you want out of your nose tackle. And then Nadi is the rookie. But uh, depth might be an issue, right? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see. I mean, this is where the, um, like, Brett Veach's complete defensive reinvention um, really comes into focus. Um, you know, he spent his first two picks on the front seven, um, you know, let some key guys get, you know, like, I mean, Benny Logan just walked without, without even a, an overture of if you want to stay for less money or something. Um, you know, and then I, th- I think we'll see Breland Speaks, which, who was the, the second round pick this year. Um, like, they're talking about using him as a linebacker, but it would surprise me, you know, in, in the hybrid fronts. Okay. That they have if he lines up along the line um, as well. It would surprise me if you had like Chris Jones, Speaks, and Bailey as your front three sometimes. Okay. Um, in some ways, depending on you know what was happening, you know, with the offense. But sure. Um, yeah, you know, it was really clear. I mean, this goes back to that Titans thing that I was talking about earlier. Not only did the Titans, or not only did the Chiefs' offense really decline once Kelsey left the game with that concussion, but then defensively. They just started running the like they ran Derrick Henry. You knew Derrick Henry was going to run the ball. Yes, and they couldn't stop Derrick Henry from running the ball. And so it, it just really seems like these just said, "Okay, this is done," and just went defense, 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 defense with those first four picks. <laughs> yeah, and the first two guys, especially you know, Naughty is an incredible you know run defender, maybe the best like two down run defender in the draft. You know, he he grabs him. So you said they're kind of reaching for some of these guys based on like. The big board and the total value, but I but I think what Peach was saying was, look, we've got a couple primary weaknesses, and if we can shore those up, being run defense and red zone offense, if we could turn the corner on these two things, we're going to be a deep playoff team. And so I think that's what he did with this draft class. All right, uh, what about uh, linebacker? Uh, you used that second round pick on Speaks this year, but last year you used a, a second round pick. Uh, on uh, Passignon. Uh, so talk about whether or not he's ready to develop. you got to keep D. Ford healthy. That's huge. Uh, and, of course, Justin Houston is big time. So how is that uh, outside unit looking? And we know how important that is in a 3-4. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm actually pretty optimistic about this group. I, you know, I think Justin Houston is much better than anyone really gives him credit for, you know, if he doesn't break the double-digit sacks, everyone's like, oh, he sucks compared to the contract that he has and whatnot. But 
But really, if, you, if you're just watching, you just realize he's so dominant and defense is key in so well on him. If, if D Ford's back is better, you know, that's someone else who can rush the passer. I'd love to see Speaks as the starter outside. Okay. Or whoever earns that between him and, and Passanio. And then let D Ford be the situational rusher who comes okay. in on those key downs. That makes a lot of sense to me. At the very least, they have many more options than they did in the past. Uh, you know, you knew Passanio was going to be, uh, was going to take one or even two years to get there. But they're saying Speaks is going to play immediately and maybe even play three downs immediately. That's what Veach was saying after the draft. And, uh, and, then, and then Andy Rivas said he's been a very quick study and, and looks the part. So it could be Speaks and Houston on the outside. Who knows? I, I, as long as we're not seeing too much Frank Zombo, um, <laughs> I, I think that works for everybody. All right. Yeah. Uh, keep him as a special teams guy, right? Uh, and yeah. that's, and uh, that, I think the fans would be happy. All right. Inside, uh, you got you got to start the season with a couple of new faces. Uh, again, like you said, you went after Reggie Ragland uh, last year, but uh, you know he uh, he's going to get opportunity to play now full time. Uh, and then you got Hitchens, uh, a very good run defender. You you, you sign him, and you also drafted uh, Dorian uh, O'Daniel. Uh, so you've got a lot of changes there compared to what you thought it was going to look like at this time last year. Uh, but Ragland's a good player. We know he can uh, he can play in the league, and uh, we know Hitchens can play in the league as well. Now Derek Johnson's gone, so that must be uh, kind of weird. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, you know, considering he's gone, uh, you know there there's some good talent left behind. Yeah, you know, Veach was very vocal in saying we're going to get faster, we're going to get a lot younger, um, and and we're gonna we're gonna build our stamina. And and then he went out. He paid big money for Anthony Hitchens. To me, that is the is the single most questionable move that Veach has made. But then Veach also said, the moment I got my job, I called the Dallas Cowboys to see if they would trade me Hitchens, and they said no. So he's been after Hitchens for a long time. Okay. Uh, and and clearly, he, you know, you, you're paying a player not for what he's done in the past, but but for what you're projecting. And so, very clearly, Brett Beach, in in using whatever metrics he has, believes that Hitchens' best football was not what we saw in sort of a sub role for Sean Lee in Dallas, but like clearly as a three down starting, you know, as as really the new heart of the defense, replacing Derek Johnson, which are yeah. big shoes to fill, but. Um, he's making a lot of money to do so. So, uh, you know, I guess you just have to trust Beach until he's not earned the benefit of the doubt, I suppose. And what about how good can Raglan be? You know, you know the, the, uh, the reputation is he's this, you know, kind of thumper role. But we saw fairly good coverage skills from him, even as he was coming back from the ACL. I, I really like him a lot, and I think his leadership, I think – um, like those intangibles plus his own natural ability. Um, I actually have high hopes for him okay. this year. And that's what surprised me so much about the Hitchens acquisition was that I thought maybe Raglan would, would, would be more of a dominant player there. And it looks like, you know, Hitchens, like if they go with a four-man front, it looks like Hitchens is going to start and, and Raglan will, will, will kind of back him up in that way. Hmm, okay. Um, Interesting. Yeah, so we'll see. And O'Daniel, is, uh, is are they going to use him? Because he's a small guy, so you, they're going to use him in, in, in like a hybrid role, a couple different yep. spots. And Okay. Uh, let's talk about that secondary. Four DBs gone, four key guys from last year's secondary gone. Peters gone, Mitchell gone, Gaines gone, Parker gone. Uh, Fuller uh, was added in the Alex Smith trade. That was uh, a, a very nice move to bring Fuller in. Uh, but after Fuller, it's like, what's going on here? Uh, <laughs> who's covering receivers? Uh, so you got some hidden gems there? You are asking the exact same question that every <laughs> single Chiefs fan I know is asking, honestly. Steven Nelson is the only holdover. Uh-oh. Um, and, and he played, you know, fine. He definitely looked much, much better in the last few games of the season. That's good. But sample size... Um, uh, to rely only on him coming back. They're going to keep Fuller. You know, Fuller made rave reviews last year, Kendall Fuller, at, at, in, in the slot yeah. in Washington. So they're going to keep him inside. But that leaves 
No. I mean, it was already <laughs> a problem finding an outside corner opposite Marcus Peters, let alone then trading Marcus Peters. So they signed David Amerson away from, you know, from Oakland. It was, it's a it's a small one-year prove-it kind of deal. But the way he looked last year in Oakland was, wasn't great. No. Um, you know, but he is only, you know, he's still only 26. So, so, I mean, it's not like, you know, he's this old veteran. He, and he's played well in the past and, and he's still young enough to That's maybe true. do it again. But, but yeah, I mean, pretty much everyone is scratching their heads going, okay, cornerback's been an issue. I mean, even last year in the draft, everyone's like draft a corner early, draft a corner early. And then we didn't. And then this year, same thing again. Um, and, so very clear. I mean, clearly, Beach is looking at the roster and saying, "Corner's not our issue." I know you're all saying it, but it's not. Otherwise, I would have grabbed one. And um, yeah, so we'll see. He was talking up. Um, you know, Brett Beach has mentioned two guys by name: Keith Reeser, who was a who was a waiver wire find from the 49ers last year. Okay. And a guy named a guy named Will Redmond, who was a former third round pick, who's kind of flamed out with three other teams. All right. So. I, I don't know why they must be standing out, and, and we haven't seen it yet. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they if they signed a free agent, honestly. I mean, sure. uh, you know, whether that's um, – yeah, I, there's a number of quality free agents still out there. I'm, I'm hoping for such an acquisition because <laughs> right now it looks like the black hole. All right. We'll see how long that takes. I mean, we're, we're close enough to training camp now. You think that maybe they'll, they'll give it a week or two. Uh, and uh, and then and let's find out whether or not they're gonna panic uh, and, and and start bringing someone in. Uh, safety situation is better, especially with Eric Berry uh, coming back. Uh, such a big blow to lose him. No, there's nothing worse as a fan than starting the season off and having one of your star players go out for the year. That is such a blow uh, that now you just got to feel like, all right, good, all right, now it's over with. We start over a couple more months. We're back to playing football, and Eric Barry's back on the field. And uh, so that's a big boost to the secondary that they didn't have last year. And there's more uh, interesting players, too. Uh, I mentioned Parker's gone, but uh, it wasn't like he w- he had a good year. So um, Robert Golden was added. Uh, but uh, Armani Watts is the intriguing uh, uh, player. I was surprised he lasted uh, as long as he did. Uh, I mean, I, I, I actually, you know, again, the fourth round is not bad. Uh, you know, he, but he could have he got drafted around too earlier. I, I think he's a talented kid. I wouldn't be surprised if he started. Yeah, I, I really wouldn't either. I um, I think everyone's kind of crossing their fingers, hoping he's the answer. He's got four years of of, uh, of great experience at Texas A&M. Um, I, I think he's got. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if he's able to just to slot right in and kind of learn as he goes, especially next to someone like Barry, who is so well studied and and like knows knows such the intricacies that he could, you know, like make sure he's kind of lining up in the right places or, or, you know, like if there's something amiss, there's no better person to learn across from Dan uh, than Aaron Perry. So, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if he earned that slot. Do they like Liam McQuay? Honestly, I haven't heard really anything about McQuay. I mean, Guess he was not. Uh, quiet last year. And yeah. This year, so, so we'll see. Uh, you know, and uh, the name here to watch for, too, is, is how they use Dorian O'Daniel and Dan Sorensen, because both of them kind of feel like that, that, you know, maybe in the box safety, maybe use them on the blitz, sure. you know, kind of. So, you know, if, if O'Daniel shows strong, it wouldn't surprise me if they cut Sorensen. That frees up probably five million bucks or so on the cap, okay. which could free up money for like a Bashad Breland on the, on the free agent list or something like that. There you go. Uh, as far as the uh, special teams is concerned, uh, Butker was uh, a tremendous uh, pickup. Uh, wow. Uh, if you can continue to get anything close to that, uh, that would be incredible. But that's what, you just never know with rookies. You, you, know, you don't know if you, know, you draft guys like Aguayo uh, and, and they're busts, and then here's a seventh rounder that can't even stick with Carolina, and then he's available, and, and he's just tremendous last year. Uh, that would be one of the top kicking performances in Kansas City Chief history. Uh, and then to go along with Dustin Colquitt and Tyreek Hill, this is a very, very good special teams unit with a very good special teams coach. Yeah, you know uh, what I what I think is going to be an, an underrated storyline heading into the season is that these new kickoff changes in the NFL, based on what coaches are saying about it, they're saying 
kickoffs are going to look more like punt returns at this point. Okay. Uh, rather than your standard kickoff return. And and Tyreek Hill was not the kick returner last year. He was the punt returner. So if it becomes basically like another punt return, <laughs> what you what you may see is a lot more Tyreek Hill on special teams again. There you go. Which only makes their special teams that much more special. That's right. So that'll be really interesting to watch. Good point. All right, so there are a lot of uh, changes. And by the way, uh, Chad Henney going to be the no- the clear number two, right? Uh, with McGloin uh, trying to battle for a roster spot, and then you got that Litton kid that's uh, going to hope to be on the practice squad. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, Henney, yeah, Henney's a clear two, and and maybe Chase Litton um, can win that number three. I mean, McGloin is a horrible pro. There's just no way around it. I don't know why you would even. <laughs> Not working at least some developmental quarterback at number three, but but yeah, for sure, so, number two. So, so you've seen McGloin uh, play necessarily against the Raiders, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> or just on on yeah. other occasions, or because I know how that is. Sometimes you get those. It's just like Stevie Nelson last year. He had a terrible game against the Jets, uh, so I remember that. Uh, that's why when you said he played better at the end of the season, I was like, okay, that's possible. Then uh, you know he, he wasn't as bad as he was in that game. Uh, but that's yeah. That's why I was wondering if 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 McGloin had like one of those Kansas City games, uh, Oakland games, and he was awful in it. But no, I just I I'm just not a I'm just not a fan. I don't, yeah, and I and I, uh, I I I think there needs to be some sort of developmental QB on the roster always. And so I was a little surprised that they didn't even like draft anyone late. Okay. Well, if you will, maybe, maybe Litton could be that guy. All right, sounds good. Well, uh, there's a lot going on with the Kansas City Chiefs, Matt. So thanks a lot for educating us before training camp in a few weeks, and uh, we look forward to definitely talking to you again at some point uh, during the season. So uh, enjoy. Uh, hopefully your uh, your players stay healthy, and it should be a, a fun ride. Uh, you, you're expecting the Chiefs. Uh, by the way, the Ch- Chiefs aren't exactly like mega favorites, considering they've been dominating this division over the last five years, right? I think I heard somewhere where in Vegas the, the win loss line was like nine and a half. <laughs> but yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, at this point, most most analysts are, are picking the Chargers, which is exactly what they did last year too. Well. I, you know what? I've seen enough young quarterbacks develop faster, like in the last five or six years, than I think I remember the, in the previous twenty. So, uh, if, if anybody can develop fast, it's Mahomes. So, I, yeah, let, let's hope so. Yeah, I think they'll be fine. All right, uh, great job, uh, Matt. Appreciate it. We'll talk to you again, uh, hopefully, real soon. Thanks so much, Greg. Appreciate it. You got it. All right, that is uh, that's your Kansas City Chief. Training camp preview from Matt Connor, Arrowhead addict that fan sided here on the Lads Football Network. Uh, we had an earlier interview today. We're talking Dallas Cowboys football, so that's already available up on the website. Uh, this show will be available up on the website as well, this interview. And uh, we'll promote it over the next couple of days. When we promote it, you can follow us on Twitter at PrimeSN because we get out now, we'll post the interviews or the shows at our lads first, and then sometimes we won't promote it for a few hours or maybe 24 hours. So if you want to know when everything's available, definitely. Uh, of course, you could just go to ourlads.com. Uh, but you could also follow us uh, at Prime SN, and we'll let you know when the interviews and the shows are definitely out and available. Now, tomorrow, uh, we're going to talk Tennessee Titans football with Kyle Madsen. Managing Editor for the TitansWire.com at USA Today. So that's Tennessee football tomorrow on the 4th of July. Yes, I'm working. And so is Kyle. Don't forget to order a subscription of your choosing, including the 2018 RLADS NFL Draft Review Guide here at RLADS.com. And thanks for listening to this edition of the OFN Meeting Room with Greg DePama on the RLADS Football Radio Network, where it's never too early to think about the start of the 2018 football season.